Good evening. I'm Lisa Krauser. I'm the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the Concord Museum. And thank you all for joining us here tonight. We have many people virtually watching as well. So hello to all of you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's forum, which is a conversation with Professor David Wallstreicher and Professor Elizabeth Maddock Dillon to discuss Wallstreicher's new book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley, A Poet's Journeys Through American Slavery and Independence, which marks the 250th anniversary of the publication of Wheatley's collection of poetry. So David Wallstreicher is Distinguished Professor of History at City University of New York Graduate Center, where he's historian of early and 19th century America with particular interests in political history, cultural history, slavery, anti-slavery, and print culture. His latest book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley, A Poet's Journeys Through American Slavery and Independence, is the most deeply researched biography of the poet. The New York Times, in a recent feature on the book, um, describes his willingness to put Wheatley smack in the middle of the raging debate over the relationship between the American Revolution and slavery, and praised his achievement in not only tracing her life, but also recreating the 18th century intellectual world Wheatley actually lived in. The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley has also received rave reviews from Oprah, who called it a rich and necessary book, and the New York Times Book Review, which said the book is at once historical biography at its best, literary analysis, Analysis at its sharpest and a subversive indictment of, culture, of current political discourse questioning the relevance of black life in our country's history. He's also the author of Slavery's Constitution, From Revolution to Ratification, Runaway America, Benjamin Franklin's Slavery in the American Revolution, and In the Midst of Perpetual Fets, The Making of American Nationalism, 1776 to 1820. Um, he's also written for the Boston Review, Atlantic.com, and the New York Times Book Review. Walt Streicher is an elected member of the American Antiquarian Society and the recipient of awards and fellowships from the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, the American Philosophical Society, and the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History. So tonight he's in conversation with Elizabeth Maddock Dillon, who is a distinguished professor of English at Northeastern University and teaches courses in the fields of early American literature, Atlantic theater and performance, and transatlantic print culture. She's the author of New World Drama, The Performative Commons in the Atlantic World, 
1649 to 1849, which won the Barnard Hewitt Award for Outstanding Research in Theater History from the American Society for Theater Research, as well as the Gender of Freedom, Fictions of Liberalism and the Literary Public Sphere, which won the Heyman Prize for Outstanding Publication, The Humanities at Yale University. She's co-editor with Michael Drexler of The Haitian Revolution, The Early U.S. Histories, Geographies, Textualities. Dylan has held numerous prestigious fellowships and grants, including Stanton Avery Distinguished Fellow at the Huntington Library, Charles War Warren Center Fellow at Harvard University, Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Advanced Research Collaborative at the Graduate U Center Graduate Center, City University of New York, National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship at the American Antiquarian Society, and a Mellon Foundation grant. So, very distinguished. I hope you enjoyed tonight's forum, and please join me in welcoming Professor David Wallstreicher and Professor Elizabeth Maddock Dillon. <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's especially a pleasure to be here to talk about um, this wonderful book, The Odyssey of uh, Phyllis Wheatley. Um, I, uh, first, I just want to congratulate you, David, on this book. It's really a, a tremendous book. Um, and I'm just going to share with you from the outset that... Um, once upon a time, long, long ago, David and I were baby professors together um, at, a, at a university far away in a little town called New Haven, Connecticut. Um, <laughs> and so it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to, to see the, the, the work that you've done here. And, uh, and I can see bits and pieces of your other books in here too, informing, the, um, informing this work. Um, so, when, when David and I um, were both teaching at Yale, I was in the English department, he was in the history department, and we kind of, were you in history? American studies. You weren't in history too? Well, well I guess I was, yeah. Also, okay. But, but we overlapped in American yeah. studies. Um, but there's, there's, a, um, there's always a little bit of tension between literary people and historians, um, so historians, his, the, the rap is, I think, um, you can tell me if I'm wrong, that um, historians think that literary people play fast and loose with the dates and the facts, and uh, literary people think that historians don't pay attention to language. Um, and <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the stereotype. But I will say I have always felt that um, that, uh, that was not at all true of your work, David, that, the, um, that he actually has a deep respect for literature and, and, uh, <clears throat> and an understanding of, um, of it. So, and this book really makes that clear, that intersection of, of, of a kind of um, uh, literary understanding and historical understanding. Um, so, um, so it was really a joy to read. Um, so I have some questions about that, um, um, sort of melding those two disciplines, but before we get into, uh, down into that, the method, um, maybe I'll just ask, why Phyllis Wheatley? Hmm. Well, uh, as Elizabeth discerned, um, there are themes in here that I've written about before, and, and actually Phyllis Wheatley makes a cameo, uh, a couple of paragraphs in my first two books, the first of which was about nationalism and political culture and was built around celebrations and celebratory discourses. And so Phyllis Wheatley's poems like Liberty and Peace, where she's celebrating the end of the Revolutionary War, I saw her as one of the black figures who was taking up this mode of participating in culture and politics and writing herself into the national story with implications for debates about the future of African Americans in the Republic. And then when I wrote about Franklin and slavery, uh, that was actually the beginning of this project because uh, we know uh, both from um, one of Wheatley's letters and from one of Franklin's letters that Franklin went to see Wheatley while she was in London in 1773. And I, so I, and I decided when I was uh, 
putting my skeptical eye on Franklin's reputation as an abolitionist, which um, was kind of something that he did at the end of his life and then was celebrated by 19th century abolitionists. And then when anti-slavery became more popular and the Founding Fathers became more popular again in the 80s and 90s, he was held up as the great anti-slavery Founding Father. And I felt the story's a lot more complicated than that. He's a political figure. He was, he tried to have it both ways. He spun the question of slavery. So I was telling that story. And I came to see this interaction he has with Wheatley in London as exemplary because he does go to see her but then he says in his, his letter oh the math, uh, her, ma her master seemed like he, she, he, he was annoyed that I was there so I just left and that was the end of it right whereas Wheatley on the other hand kind of br puts him on a list of eminent people she's meeting in London and um, then she actually proposes to dedicate her second book to him uh, a few years later so uh, so you get to around 2000, 2010, and the, the scholars who like Franklin are saying, oh, look, he was enlightened enough to go see Phyllis Wheatley. And the scholars who, like, who are, want to show how important and famous Wheatley was say, oh, look, even Franklin came according, came to uh, see her. And I felt, well, you know, actually, this is a, there's a kind of diplomacy going on here. They're both on the public stage. Franklin actually, as I, I argue in the book, I'm going on telling, I, I don't, I have, this is a story I haven't gotten to tell much, so I'm going on and, and uh, but this is so, I felt that, that too, I felt was a lot more complicated, what's going on between them and a lot more revealing, and it's an example of Wheatley's interactions with these major public figures who had to respond to her, both Dartmouth, Washington, Franklin, Thomas Jefferson posthumously. So really with, like, with my uh, argument with both the Franklin and the Wheatley scholars about that interchange, I was on my way. I knew that the story about Wheatley's relation to the revolution really hadn't been told before, except you know, there were, uh, in a, a, few, a few really great essays had sort of touched on it by um, David Grimstead and B Betsy Urkula more recently. Uh, but really, I felt that there was a more of a story there, and that so that's the beginnings of the book. Actually, doing it was took 12 years, but <laughs> I can talk about that too. Yeah, David just told me it took him 12 years, and I, it doesn't surprise me because there's a there's a real um, depth of of research in this book that, um, as you read it, is really apparent on every page. Um, I'm thinking for people who are maybe not as familiar with Phyllis Wheatley's um, work or her life, um, maybe one way to kind of get into both that story and this book um, is to begin with what are what are some of the um, kind of truisms about Phyllis Wheatley, which have changed over time, as as you said, but what are some of the truisms about Phyllis Wheatley that you um, see this book as engaging and uh, perhaps dispelling um, or giving us a, a, a really different look at who she is. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with two. Um, one about her origins and one about what her fame m means and, and how that plays into the way we understand the end of her life. She dies young in 1784. She's only 31 years old. Um, so Wheatley comes over on uh, a ship named the Phyllis, and that's why that's why her um, the Wheatleys gave her that name. We don't know what her what her previous name was, and um, within a few years, and she is and, and how old? Seven. She's se she's about six or se she's about seven years old. Yeah, and within a few years, she's reading and writing and experimenting with writing verse. At the beginning, kind of, uh, as you would expect from someone very young, uh, uh, ballad-like stuff, kind of, uh, then she's experimenting with elegies, and it's more and more impressive, and the Wheatleys start to show it around, and within a few years, uh, by the time she's 14, the, she's, published, she's publishing poems in newspapers, she's starting to be well-known, but there's this, there's this um, sense that she is this kind of remarkable genius who was cultivated in a way by keeping her away from other Africans and from what slavery was like for most of the most enslaved people. 
I'm, I'm arguing that this is a time of uh, when she comes over in 1761, this is a time of increased imports, uh, uh, ships from Africa coming to New England, that, and there's a, a kind of uptick in the number of young Africans in Boston, and she really is part of a cohort, and you, what you can see in the newspapers in the advertisements uh, for the sale of these people is that many of them were quite skilled, and you know, there's an, for example, like there's a one teenage tradesman who could have come over on the same ship as, as Wheatley is referred to as having a genius for a tradesman. So these people are not just kind of doing um, unskilled domestic labor, they're doing very skilled labor, they are assimilating, and they are also forming a community that is going to actually be a source of worry and concern for the patriots when they are part, some of the, uh, the, young, the young people and the rabble who are making trouble in the streets. Uh, in the later 1760s and early 1770s. So that's the kind, so I'm trying, trying to put her back in the context of, uh, of Africans in Boston in her time and, and say that she, that she, and so that we shouldn't assume that she has nothing to do with them. Actually, she is um, uh, being bold like, uh, and she's not the only one who's, uh, who's doing that. And she knows that the, um, that, uh, slavery uh, is, gets politicized during the lead up to the revolution and that that is an opportunity for folks like her. The other, um, one of the other myths I'm, I'm uh, dealing with is that, um, so Wheatley becomes a kind of poster child for the early anti-slavery movement and, and for the power of literacy and conversion. And some of her poems seem uh, like the famous one on being brought from Africa to America uh, have been under, sometimes been understood as uh, accepting what, what was called and sometimes called the, the fortunate fall idea. The idea that, okay, um, I'm, in, I'm enslaved but I've been converted and so I'm better off than I was in Africa. And this became an important defense of slavery, uh, and she's dealing with it in that poem where she invokes it, in, uh, though I think by the, by the time we get to the other four lines of that poem, she's using it to criticize the racism of the people she's addressing. So there are, there are myths about her kind of uh, as a, um, what used to be called an Oreo, as someone who's so assimilated so as not to be concerned with black liberation, not be concerned about um, her African heritage, not be concerned with politics, and that those, th those things are just not true. Actually, she uses Christianity, um, the uh, imperial controversy, and a lot of other stuff that she picks up that's going on in order to address a, a whole range of topics, definitely in a Christian idiom, but also in one that uh, builds on Greek and Roman classics and on current events. And, and when she, she, she writes elegies to lots of people the Wheatley knew, Wheatley's knew, and people she knows, she also write, but, and she, but she also writes elegies to major, major ministers in Boston uh, and uh, local authorities, and eventually to military figures, and even before the war, with with the occupation of Boston, she's interacting with these with these these um, these officers, and so that so she's uh, looking for patrons and um, opening up possibilities that. Uh, we don't know what would have happened if she had lived longer or um, the war hadn't happened, which tanks the economy and, um, makes, and she loses her patrons and she can no longer play, uh, play folks in London off of folks in Boston. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm also arguing against emphasizing her tragic end as kind of an inevitable thing uh, or, um, or even a tragedy. Rather, I think the emphasis should be on just how much she achieved and um, uh, the fact that um, she almost invented a career for a poet, which is something that was un had never happened before. It, it hardly even existed in London, much less in, the, in North America. So um, one of the, when I teach Phyllis Wheatley, um, 
one of the things that I invite the students to, to do is to look at this, um, this picture of Wheatley. There's actually now a statue of Wheatley that's on, um, I think it's on Com Ave, um, together with two other uh, women writers. And the statue is based on this, um, on this image. And um, one of the things that we talk about is that, that the way that this image actually plays into that kind of truism that, that I think that your book really effectively causes us to question, which is that she is um, a complete exception to everything, right? So she's an exception to um, slavery because she had this, uh, she didn't, she didn't, she had, um, the, the Wheatleys were so kind and generous to her that she never really had to do any kind of labor. She immediately became a, me a member of the family. She was highly educated. And so she um, just got to go to her room and, and write, um, you know, look up at the sky at the muse and write things. And, and then the second part of that truism is that she, um, that her, her poetry was really not very um, political when it came to the question of slavery, right? That she, that she kind of um, uh, sold out, so to speak, in order to maintain her position um, as this sort of fortunate exception. Um, and what your book does is actually show how, um, as you said, she's in the midst of a, of a big community of um, uh, enslaved Africans. She's in the middle of revolutionary Boston. She's in the middle of revolutionary Boston where they're trying to figure out are white people in Boston slaves to England? Or, and if they're slaves to England, then how, and they're complaining about that, then how are they going to justify the fact that they are enslaving black people? What does that language of slavery do to the language of liberty? during the American Revolution. And that, that Wheatley is, um, she's right there in the thick of it, right? In the, right there in the thick of, uh, uh, of figuring that out um, and participating and shaping that conversation, right? She's not off in some attic um, writing flor flowery language that doesn't have to do with anything. But in fact, she's in the, the middle of the debates of the day. That's not really a question, but <laughs> I don't know if you want to jump in there. One of the reasons the book took a long time, or it's actually, in some ways, it's a two-part thing, uh, was that um, I, I wrote a few scholarly essays based on things I knew and sources that I knew and sources that everybody who's written about Wheatley knows. Uh, but I, I had a hunch because uh, that there was more going on that I could find about both about Africans and about the battle over the language of slavery and liberty in the newspapers. I put it off, that part of the research, in part because I was afraid that I was applying, I was afraid that I would be applying my method in other books. My Franklin book came out of reading these, these run, runaway ads for slaves and servants that were in his newspaper and realizing, uh, with, when reading his autobiography with students and realizing, oh, well, he's one of these people. He ran away from his brother uh, and, um, and my, and my first book, the book about the celebrations, those were based on, on reports of these events in newspapers. So I was afraid that I, I didn't want to, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing something more literary here, I'm doing African American history centrally. I can't apply the same method, you know, that would be, that, that, so I, I put it off. But then when I started, and I ended up reading, looking at every, pa every page of every Boston newspaper from 1760 to 1784, 
that itself took years, but what what I, I started finding these things, like like figuring out that that there were more young Africans in Boston when she when she went, when, after she got there than uh, most scholars had had assumed, and certainly than most scholars who've written about Wheatley had assumed. Uh, those all, a lot of that stuff came out of the leads in in the newspapers and. Um, that also, but I guess I had to make my peace with what is, in, in essence, is, a, is my method, which is to, to um, both read these newspapers extensively and intensively, which is to say, kind of to read like a historian and to read like a, a literature scholar or a rhetoric scholar. Do, could you say a little bit about um, the, the political role of... Um, Africans in Boston during the period of the revolution because it's it's pretty complicated um, and I think you do a really nice job. Um, I, 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 one of the reasons I would recommend reading this book is that um, particularly for those of us who live in this area, area is that it really gives you a picture of 18th century Boston as a community in which there was a sizable community of black folks who were in the streets um, and in the public sphere and, and were actors there. So for instance, one of the, um, one of the things that I didn't know is that the, um, that the uh, is it William Andrew, who was the um, black soldier for, um, in the Boston Massacre? His last name is Andrew, right? Uh, no. Um. So Christmas Attucks is on the is on the uh, uh, Patriot side, but there is equally um, uh, a sort of prominent black soldier who's a figure on the British side, right? So in a way that that um, for me that rearranges our picture of thinking about um, uh, what's the history of the. Um, of the American Revolution, because we so often associate the, um, you know, the, the the patriots with freedom, and the and the British with tyranny, right? Um, but it, but in fact, that story is much more confusing when it's told from the perspective of um, enslaved Africans who are living in Boston at the time. I send you down a rabbit hole. Yeah, I can't remember. His, I can't remember his name either. Um, but the so the the key thing here is that at several points in the occupation of Boston and the controversies leading up to the Boston massacre, the the presence of uh, black uh, black occupying soldiers, and they're some of the first ones who come off the ship because they're the ones playing the music which also means that when soldiers get disciplined in a public way because they've, they've broken the rules, it's also their job to uh, do the ritual beating or whipping as well as play the music. So this is just something that like the, the British military people just take for granted. It's not, you know, and like, you know, like somebody has a special skill, you put them in that job and, you know, and the, these, these guys are just, you know, they're just, uh, the, this is at a time when you know scholars have estimated in the late 18th century as much as up to 20 percent of the British Navy as people of color, right? So this is this is uh, not that new, but you put them in Boston where uh, and um, where, with all these bored soldiers, some of them looking for work, and um, uh, th these. Conflicts that are happening over 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 um, over people being policed, and it's just a it's just a tinderbox, and so you have um, several incidents where there's an inc there's an inc there's uh, one fairly well known incident where uh, one of the uh, occupying officers, uh, probably drunk, uh, uh, like goes in the street waving his sword, like call, saying, calling all the, the Negroes to saying, you know, like, you know, that they should, that they should just, they should just join, that they, that they should, um, 
free themselves they, and join they should, the British. They should, free them, they should free themselves and, you know, and join the army, that, like, that we're going to, you know, that we're just going, and, um, and then uh, they, they kind of, they kind of, um, reassign this guy and there's very little like it's like so the, what's going on with the Patriots is fascinating because something like some of these things they're, they're publicizing because it's showing how bad the occupation is but this other dimension of it where they're very worried about this fifth column they're trying also to kind of tamp that down so and you can see this happening in, in the newspapers and in, in, in some of the other evidence where they are not like basically it's just not clear which side the black people are going to be on and so that creates opportunities on both on uh, on for enslaved people and for free Africans like Christmas addicts to um, get involved center stage and we kind of we know they're there but we don't know the intensity of the, the people not knowing what uh, there being this population who are like thoroughly assimilated both to the British military and to the streets of Boston and depending on what happens they may end up playing an important role. I'll just, just one other example is this, this becomes actually central at the trial of the, of the officers um, for the, um, the murder of the, of the five, um, the deaths of the five uh, uh, people who die at the Boston Massacre because um, some enslaved people are, were there and are testifying. And one of the guys who testifies um, is actually uh, his writing poems. Uh, this is um, Andrew Wendell. That's, That's the one who I was thinking of. Yeah. Andrew Wendell, like his, his, the issue of his writing poems and, and uh, being literate becomes an issue at the trial. You have John Adams uh, who um, uh, 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 mocking him, and you have uh, his his master um, actually saying, "No, like he's actually like quite accomplished, and like I would trust him with anything." And so you have this like this sort of the the, the character of this, guy, this this very skilled guy who's kind of like a male version of Phyllis Wheatley. And Sam Adams is mo Sam Adams in the newspaper mo in, uh, mocks him, saying, "Oh, that th those things they're calling his poems—that's just him like trying to get girls. That's just him trying to <laughs> impress the, the wenches, right? Like, okay, do we really know that? What is what is Andrew Wendell writing? And 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 what is the significance of him actually giving testimony that might determine the course of this trial, which has huge implications for how the whole world is seeing what's going on in Boston? So this is a this is an example of of uh, and even the great new books, the great recent books by Serena Zabin and um, Eric Hinderaker on the Boston Massacre, terrific books that I, that I relied on. Uh, neither of them uh, really do, do that much with it, as much as, uh, as, much with this as, uh, as I think they might have. So, so let's, let's put uh, Phyllis Wheatley in this, in this world then. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, as you do in this book, um, one of the things that I think um, is, uh, uh, is is hard to understand from our perspective is how difficult or how challenging it was for her to get published, um, how, how challenging it was for her to publish her book. Um, so there was an, an initial effort that failed to publish it in Boston and she subsequently found a patron in England who helped her publish it. But um, there's some, really some, some brilliant legwork that you do here about, about how incredibly strategic she is about all of those moves and making it happen and how challenging it is. Yeah, I don't even know. I'm not even sure how, where to start or what to emphasize there. But it is. It is. And 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 there had been there's been other good scholarship on this that I'm that I was building on. But it, it really is. Um, there's a tendency just to assume that okay, nobody nobody wants to publish her book because of racism. But on the other hand, there's some people who really want to publish her book because she's black. And then there are other people who really want, who want to read more of her poems because she's good. You know, she's like really, and then people are recognizing that. So there are multiple things happening in the question of the, the strategy of how to do it and for what purposes uh, making it a book. It's not clear, and, but what is fairly clear is that the patriots in Boston don't want to publish, don't want to publish her. Uh, they, uh, even though some of them have been occasionally 
bringing up, like saying uh, uh, saying that maybe we should uh, end the slave trade to Boston, and uh, but that's not getting through the assembly. And when, and when it does get through the assembly, Governor Hutchinson vetoes it, saying because this is a, you, you can't you can't this is a, there there's the, there it is. We're right there with the American Revolution. The question of what to do about the slave trade is already a problem of sovereignty. Governor, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, the governors uh, Bernard and then Hutchinson uh, basically say this is the this is Parliament's prerogative or the King's prerogative. You can't you can't ban the slave trade. Just like just like we don't want you printing your own money. Like this is you know they they can see a dot a, a direct line between doing things like this and effectual independence. And that's not that's not emphasized enough. We separate the issue of slavery from the rest of governance, whereas everybody then saw it as a question of, of trade and regulation, and it has implications for who's allowed to do what for all these other political questions. So uh, the question of, of uh, uh, what it might mean if Wheatley publishes it and who publishes it and how it might get used, I think very early on the Patriots realized that if they're complaining about, uh, about their enslavement and there's this brilliant enslaved poet in Boston that uh, what does happen immediately upon its publication is some of the Tories, some of the people who are skeptical of the resistance movement, start to say that the Americans are a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah. And you can see it in the press, and it's happening, it has happening in London. And so, who, in, who, so it's not, it, it's, uh, there, p different people have uh, different perspectives on, on what her publishing will do and the, and the printers have to make some money and it just doesn't, like it almost happens a few times in Boston and then and it doesn't and then they, then, so then they end up going over and uh, have the sponsorship of, of Countess Huntingdon who's really interested in converting natives and is also uh, pub uh, helping publish some of the first slave narratives uh, at this time and, uh, but is not particularly anti-slavery herself. Uh, but what, what... She's just pro-conversion. She's, she's just mainly... She's <laughs> pro-conversion, and she's particularly interested in converting indigenous people and Africans. Um, so it's unclear what the purpose of, 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 pub of publishing it as a book is going to mean, and it just, it's just changing from year to year, and that's why it almost happens and doesn't happen, and then, and then uh, but by the time it does happen, uh, we're really at another stage of the imperial controversy where it's very clear that this is, um, that uh, everybody, uh, a lot of the initial reviews and, and, and commentary on it is, okay, this, how can they keep her as a slave? It's said quite explicitly. Uh, and as a result, um, in another set of complicated uh, things that I, that I have a chapter on, like the possible scenarios of, she ends up, um, becoming free because the book is published. It may have been in the cards already. They may have discussed it. Maybe she was going to be free when she was 21 or eventually. But it happens a lot quicker because she goes over to London and becomes even more famous than she, than she already was. And it's embarrassing to the Wheatleys and it's embarrassing to the Patriot movement, which they're not necessarily a part of. So, so I, um, in, before we turn to Q&A, I thought it might be um, nice to actually look at a poem, um, being the literature professor that I am. <laughs> so I was looking, um, and I thought uh, that on being brought from Africa to America, which is one of her most well-known and also most controversial poems, um, and David already mentioned it, um, uh, because it seemingly says at the beginning, she seems to say, lucky me that I was um, uh, taken from Africa because that allowed me to become a Christian. Um, isn't that great? Um, but then at the end, there's a, there's a, a turn, a volta, um, uh, and the, and, and what I would say, and I think you say this as well, um, is that the she is playing exactly that dance of saying, uh, I think there's some hypocrisy here, right? The same way that you were just saying that if if her book was published, um, the patriots were concerned, it would reveal them to be um, hypocritical, right? And so she is, so many times in her po poetry, she is simultaneously um, performing her patriotism or her Americanness and her Christianity and then using that 
to say, and maybe there's some hypocrisy here <laughs> at the end. So I don't know. Do you want to read that and say a few words about it? Sure, sure. Um, so she first publishes this in the volume, though uh, there's uh, evidence that she wrote it as much as uh, in 1768, but she doesn't publish it until, until the book is published. "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. So what I think is happening here, uh, to shorthand it, is that she's talking to, we, we know that the, the Methodists, for example, were already arguing that it was problematic to justify slavery by, through conversion. Uh, and it's, it's already controversial. Um, so she's saying, you people who still think this, that like, that like, this is what you want me to say. I'm so glad that, that, uh, that I'm saved now. I didn't know redemption you know, when I was in Africa. But then she turns it around. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. She's talking about like racists, ba racists basically. This is, what they, this is what they think. Remember Christians, and it's, it's outsized Christians, Negroes, the people you call Negroes, like you so-called Christians, these people you call Negroes, who are who call black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. It's like it's almost a parody of this idea of like of refinement and like, like okay, like, like okay, if you think that this is, like, if you, if you want, if you, we want to think of it this way, that we can be refined and be equal, fine. Look, look at me. I've already done this. But I'm, but I'm telling you, this whole process that you put me through is shot through with racism. And I'm not going to like just pretend that it's just like all perfect because all the Africans are going to be saved. There's still a basic problem here. And the problem is not so much slavery as it is racism. That's what I, that's what I think. It, that's what I've, I've, been bold, I've been increasingly bold in arguing that because nobody, because I'm getting away with it. But uh, that's, that's what I, that's what, at, least, at least nobody, nobody's saying I'm wrong yet. Um, but uh, that's what I think. I'm more and more convinced that this is, that this is the, uh, I mean, this is really, uh, you could say it's the beginning of a tradition of um, satirical anti-racism in black letters and politics that uh, is unbroken to our time. And it's a great example of how um, so many of these debates we're having now about uh, the place of slavery and black people in the era of the American Revolution, they were already having them then. And Wheatley, Wheatley, Wheatley helped make that happen. She forced the issue. And, and she shows us that there's, uh, she also shows us that this is probably, there are probably conversations that we'll never recover that were also going on. We shouldn't just assume that just because John Adams didn't talk about black people often, though he does actually more than, more than you would think. That, that, like, so Gordon Wood often says that, that, that no, nobody was thinking, that nobody knew slavery was wrong, and, and the, the, there's no story there in the American Revolution and the founding fathers about slavery or black people because they just didn't talk about it. Right. Well, actually, they did talk about it some, and but we shouldn't take their word for that there are conversations happening because they had a vested, they, as politicians, they had a vested interest in not talking about it publicly. And so, when we put, when we see what Wheatley is doing in places like this, and when she's interacting with them, we like we can we we have to. Um, uh, realize that, that um, we can't just take the founders at their words or say that their words are the best or only evidence uh, for what was, what, was actually, what was actually going on. Not to mention that it's brilliant poetry because, you know, in the tradition of Shakespeare or Pope or the idea that, that, that the opening of a poem sort of sets forth an idea and then at the end, you flip it in a way that, uh, that, that turns the reader in a whole new direction that they hadn't anticipated. And that's exactly what she's doing here. Um, I think we want to move on to some questions now. Am I right?
Any audience questions? I'll be so bold and first say thank you and sorry for the tardiness. Um, you know, I, this was such a treat um, and I thank you. Um, I just, I'm new to the area and I'm like, yeah, the only black woman in here and I feel like an endangered species at times, well, most of the time, because I'm not from Massachusetts. Like, I was spiritually led here. I'm a biblical activist and also a woman currently a plaintiff in federal court. And I can see um, that's a plaintiff fighting for my civil rights. And when you read that, I never really, heard, I knew about Phyllis Wheatley, but not a whole lot. It's not as much as I realize about when you read that poem, the only thing I could think of is she read scripture. Oh, yeah. How much scripture have you read after reading her poems? I can tell you exactly why, why she felt the way she did, because we weren't the Christians on the boat, we were the cargo. That 400 years for the record, people will realize that these kind of conversations, are, the founding fathers didn't want to have that because they knew the scriptures too. First Peter 2 and uh, 9 and 10, for ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that should show the forth of the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, which in a time were not past a, a people, but now the people of God, which are not, which were not obtaineth mercy but now have obtained mercy. That's where she got that from. She inculcated and switched it back over because if you continue with that scripture, it really then addresses to then the Christians that brought us over here. I, I have a, that my question is, when you've been reading and learning about her, did you inquire about the God she was serving or the God of the, us that we continue to serve as I pass through here, through this area, as someone who was charged falsely with, with a homicide as a black registered nurse that has been petitioning for the freedom of our people, not our liberation, but our true justice. Did you ever think about the God that we were serving or why we were still here? Because you get to write a book about things that we don't even get to know our own history. So I would have to explain, I pray that, and I ask, did you even get to know the God that she was serving to get to know how you wrote that book? I was certainly very concerned with her religiosity and those of the Wheatleys and the rest of the people she was interacting with. I don't know that my um, testifying about my faith and background as qualifications for writing this book is really, um, I'm not sure how important that is. Uh, those of us who study the 18th century kind of take it for granted that we're studying religious people who were believers and that we have to be sensitive to that. Or spiritual. Yeah, religion. Because we did, they did, there's a reason why they didn't want us to know how to read. And as someone in federal court, and these other people on their fourth law firm, I'm walking in the spirit of that moment and I can show you where the scriptures just by listening to her poems. Okay. That's very powerful. And I pray that when people write about us, they get to know who we serve. Them. It's heavy. That was certainly true of Harriet Tubb. Right. That uh, was the voices that she heard. All of us. And that's why I'm here in an area where it wasn't intended for me to be here. Definitely are welcome, but we do question our, our freedom. We're still 400 years later. Any other questions? Who were some of the poets that... Who were some of the poets of her era that she um, studied or, um, you know, was inspired by? Well, she, uh, Pope, Milton, many of the popular, you can see traces of and influences of uh, many of the popular 17th and 18th century English poets. One of the things that I put more emphasis on than uh, uh, that 
and um, is the reason for the title, is that I, I, I early on realized, decided that um, Greek and Roman classics gave her, which were not seen as necessarily incompatible with religion uh, uh, at the time, gave uh, the, in works, especially in, in Homer uh, and in Pope's version of Homer, uh, those books are about voyages, w wars, enslavement, traffic in women, a lot of these things that she saw in her African and Atlantic and North American worlds, she would have seen in this literature. That Mediterranean world and her Atlantic world had things in common. So I had, to, so I tried to read everything that I thought that, that I could figure that she read, and I, st I, I started with some of that stuff because I didn't, I hadn't read a lot of it, I, even though I was an English major and and I, I kept uh, I kept studying and teaching American literature. I didn't have that uh, background in Greek and Roman classics, and when I started to pay attention to this stuff, I thought, oh, look, she can, she's not going to see this stuff as foreign. It's really familiar, and so maybe she's able to play with it, and in doing so, talk about things that she couldn't talk about directly, including her experience as a woman as an enslaved person, as an African in a, in a war-torn war West Africa, West Africa in the 1750s. Um, it's the, um, the, the raiding and the wars between different polities have sort of gone to another level, not unlike what's happening actually in, in the British Empire in the 1750s. So, um, and uh, it may be that in my excitement over that, I may have actually not spent as much time with scriptures as uh, I might have. And, but and I, I, I'll be interested to see if, um, if, uh, if folks um, think that. Uh, if, if that's the case, it's partly because really the scriptural stuff was really the um, stuff. Uh, it's both, it's, um, it's, more, it's more familiar to me. And um, I hope I didn't take it for granted, but um, it felt easier to to deal with and to show that 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 remains important to her. Though I do think that there's some there was some kind of um, performing in her Christianity uh, because um, she gets rewarded for doing it some ways, and that there you can definitely see moments where she's pushing back against being the specific kind of evangelical that some uh, white folks want her to be. Professor Gates at Harvard wrote a book about the trials of Phyllis Wheatley. Could you comment on it, and were you surprised at the outcome? Uh, the trial never happened. Um, uh, that, well, that, that, that book is really um, uh, his Jefferson lectures uh, uh, at the Library of Congress and a, a, a lovely New Yorker article that, that then was published as a book. and. Uh, before that book, and for many years, uh, Gates had been um, introducing his talks and some of his, and some of his essays about Wheatley, uh, which, he's, which uh, he'd written about in many places, uh, many times, with this scene. He called it the primal scene of African-American letters, where supposedly Wheatley is examined by the worthies of Boston, ministers, Thomas Hutchinson, lawyers, people like that. And they, they test her to see if she actually could possibly have written these poems. The problem is that um, that didn't need, it, it didn't, I, I'm certain it never happened because these guys knew her already. She'd written poems, she'd been in their parlors, she, she'd written poems about some of their relatives. They know very well who she is. She doesn't have to undergo a test. And Gates even, he even, even at one point compares it to a, a graduate, like a, a graduate exam, like a, an oral exam for, for a PhD student. Um, I guess that's him bringing his life to, uh, <laughs> to, to, the, to, the, to history. But, um, so uh, I, I'm not the first person to point this out, though. Um, uh, and, and 
I think uh, Gates got it from. He cites in the in the bibliography of the book. He cites the um, this wonderful young adult book by Shirley Graham. It was published in 1948, which was a fictionalized young adult book. So there's invented dialogue and all that thing. And she starts with this scene, and she had actually done that before. It was a book. It would actually been a radio play in the late 30s that she did. Uh, and um, I think that that kind of seeped into his into his memory and popular culture, and he and he plays with it, and he even doesn't actually say it happens. He says, "Imagine the scene." He doesn't actually. He's too good a scholar to like you know like actually invent invent like something that didn't happen. But like it, it's now it's everybody it's it's the thing this that scene is the thing that we that Wheatley is best known about Wheatley's life. So it's a, it's a it's a bit of a problem. So I am I am to some extent playing playing historian and cop on, on the The reason for that is that her book opens with this attestation oh, by these by these uh, prominent figures and so hence the construction of this scene but there's a scholar named uh, Joanna Brooks who was she the first one to really kind of take that on or I don't know if she was but it, it, she has an article that I love where she suggests that instead what happens is that Wheatley has this manuscript and she essentially goes around to these guys and says look would you sign for me right and that's a really different story about and it's again the story about her agency and her savvy and her strategy in getting these prominent men to essentially blurb her book right <laughs> or uh, yeah. uh, in, in some ways and then and the, that piece of paper is necessary because she's going to England it's the, the, that's where the skepticism is. That's where they need to know that she actually wrote wrote them because they haven't seen her writing, or you know, so they don't. So um, it, it, that, and that's why the piece of paper literally ends up being in the in the front matter of the book. We have time for one more question. I, I look forward to reading your book, but could you address the uh, how you the structure you used and what decision you made in terms of deciding on how to structure your biography? I, I'd love to. <laughs> um, okay. uh, most of the the chapters are short. M m most of them have at least one poem in them, and often toward the end of the chapter. What I'm trying to do is suggest that her poems were actions, as well as the best evidence for what she's thinking and doing. And so that while the, the as a biography, it, it's a conventional biography in the sense of moving chronologically through her life, the real, the real nodes of um, the drama I'm trying to establish is here, is, here are the things that are going on that she absorbs and they culminate in her writing this poem and this is why she did it and this is what the poem means. I don't always say that as explicitly as I just did, but that's the, so I'm trying to both um, uh, interpret her poems and also uh, use them to show her development as an artist and as a person and how and use what what I think of what I came to think of as the footprints like the the the, the evidence that other people recorded about what she's doing and try to use those in relation to the poems and and keep some some sense of drama uh, in that so that's that's sort of that's sort of the method and the chapters are short in part because of the limits of evidence but they're also short because I'm I'm asking people to uh, pay a, pay a lot of attention to context and to um, actually read the poems and so I thought that short chapters would be would do would be more reader friendly and more more dramatic but it's it's a different form than anything I've really uh, I've really ever done before I'm very proud that I got to 24 chapters though <laughs> the reason is is that um, Homer's Odyssey has 24 chapters <laughs> any closing thoughts Elizabeth or David uh, no but I just well, I guess the answer is yes, since I'm going to go on. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I just appreciated your answer to the last question, because it, for me it kind of circles back to um, the fact that, that, that you really are 
um, thinking of her as a writer, as, as an artist, as a poet, um, and, um, and, and reading her work as well as um, thinking about it historically. So it does have this really wonderful blending of like taking the literature seriously as well as giving us this kind of deep dive into the history at the same time. That, that was what I, what I wanted to do. And um, it was to me really a, a return to my education. I was a double major in English and history as an undergraduate. And I got my PhD in the American Studies program where we studied literature in relation to the times and uh, I, my, I cut my teeth uh, as a teaching assistant teaching interdisciplinary courses and teaching American literature as well as American history so um, while my day job for most of my career has been teaching history and occasionally in American studies programs I, I, um, I'm really uh, glad that this project enabled me to get back to, to doing what I really love to do the most, which is do both these things at the same time and have them uh, feed off each other or inform each other. Well, thank you both so much. This was wonderful.